what would be a good number, kind of a healthy blood glucose range? And then what what should look what should it look like? Let's say you know postprandial or right after a meal, you know, and then in the next hour, the next two hours, and what's kind of a dysfunctional blood glucose regulation? What is that? What do the the numbers look like for that? Com- let's compare that. Sure, sure, yeah. So uh, a good range is eighty to one hundred and twenty milligrams per deciliter. So you know, if I was going to set my CGM which you can do this if you have one in your app. But uh, I would set it between 80 and 120. That's Now, it may go a little bit above that sometimes. That's okay. You want to be in that range about 90% of the time. So uh, if you set it, most of those are set too high. Like you'll see them set to 140 or even 180 oftentimes. And so people say, oh, I'm in range all the time. Well, the range is way too big, right? So uh, 80 to 120 is a is a good range. Uh, some people do tend to have a little bit lower blood sugar, and and you know that can be okay. It's mostly people who are doing like plant based diets or eating a lot of carbohydrates, but are still very insulin sensitive and healthy, and lean and fit. Their blood sugar can sometimes run a little bit at the low end of that, so they may need to adjust that down a bit. Like maybe 70 is okay for them. But for most people, 80 to 120 is a good range. If you're looking at pre and post meal blood sugar changes, what we call the uh, glycemic response to a meal, uh, typically about 30 points is, is sort of considered acceptable, tolerable, ideal. So if your blood sugar is 90 before you eat, you don't want it to go above 120 in that situation. Now, that does sort of depend on what you're eating. So, you know, if you, let's say you are an athlete and you're active and you fit and and you're fit and you decide you want to eat a couple servings of fruit with nothing else. So you have an apple or a banana and a, you know, and some grapes or something. I mean, these aren't ideal for somebody with diabetes, but again, if you're active and fit and metabolically healthy and you feel like you can tolerate those well, you might see a little bit more of a glucose uh, excursion from those. Your blood sugar might go up 40 points or 45 points. As long as it comes down pretty quickly and doesn't come down too low, I'm okay with that. I think if you know if you look at it an hour after your meal and your glucose glucose went up by say 40 points, and an hour later it's right back down to baseline. It didn't, you didn't have like a, it didn't drop, you know, too low where you went hypoglycemic, then that's totally fine. You know, your, your area under the curve or the amount of time where your blood sugar was above baseline was still a very small period of time. And so that's not really unhealthy or dangerous. We'll see those same glucose excursions, by the way, sometimes from exercise, you might go do a high intensity interval a training program or a sprint, and you might see your blood sugar go up by 50 or 60 points. But usually, again, within an hour, it's going to be right back down to baseline. So I'm okay with that. But generally, we're typically looking for about 30 points from a from a normal meal, you know, a meal that is, uh, you know, consists of some sort of protein and vegetables mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, something that most of us would eat for lunch or dinner. And that's like in the first hour or two, when should it go back to baseline? How long should it take? Yeah, it's a, that's another good question. And this is a good way to assess your insulin sensitivity. If your blood sugar goes up, let's say it goes up by 30 or 40 points and it takes five hours to recover back to baseline, uh, you are likely insulin resistant. And the insulin resistance there is likely in the muscles and or fat cells because that's where the glucose is going to go after a meal, mostly Mm -hmm. in the muscles. So what we should see is within two hours, we want to see your blood sugar come back to baseline after a normal meal. So um, after like a high sugar meal, and uh, I'm not talking about a, you know, a candy bar or bag of Skittles. I'm talking about like maybe a couple pieces of fruit here. But after a high sugar meal, like a couple pieces of fruit with nothing else, we'd like to see that recovery even faster. Um, One interesting thing is fat in your meal will delay your 
uh, glycemic recovery. So you are going to see a little bit of a longer curve. It shouldn't go up as much, but it will take a little bit longer to mm. recover because the fat from your meal is holding, um, basically sort of making you temporarily a little bit more insulin resistant because the body wants to hold the fat back in the fat cells because you've got to mm. process this fat that you're eating. So you will see a, a little bit of a longer uh, recovery from like a high fat meal. So it may take up to four hours for it to come back to baseline. But again, you shouldn't see it go up as much. How about a high protein meal? Will, will we yeah, uh, see protein a lot doesn't, of protein and carbs? Yeah, protein doesn't do that as much, but it will delay the glucose absorption. So like, let's say you have a high protein, high carb meal, you know, steak and potatoes or something like that. Uh, there, you probably won't see as high of a glucose excursion as you would if you just had the potato. But it may take a little bit longer to recover because that glucose is getting into your system over a longer period of time. So it's more of a, a trickle effect than it is a surge of, of mm -hmm. glucose. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Now you mentioned insulin earlier. What's, what is the role of insulin? What is its job? And how does somebody develop insulin resistance? Yeah, so insulin has several uh, several important jobs. The two main jobs from a metabolic and blood sugar perspective are its anabolic effect, which means it stimulates growth, and its anti-catabolic effect, which means it stops the breakdown of tissue. Okay, so those are two different things. They sound like maybe they're the same, but I'll explain how it works. So when you eat a meal uh, with any type of fuel, but uh, glucose is the primary stimulator of insulin release. So your pancreas is a, is a glucose sensor. Think of a thermostat. Your pancreas actually has its toe dipped in your blood all the time and it's checking for glucose. And when it registers a little bit of extra glucose, it starts ramping up the machinery to release some insulin in order for the body to use that glucose. Now, when I say the body, we're mainly talking about the muscles here. And that could be your heart muscle or your skeletal muscle. Uh, glucose will will just flow right into your liver. It'll flow right into your brain, not all parts of the brain, but most of your brain and several other areas. But muscles need insulin to take in glucose. So without insulin, that glucose floats around and the muscles don't get it. Uh, so as soon as the pancreas sees a little extra glucose, it releases that insulin that activates the glucose channels in the muscles for them to take that up. And what it's doing essentially is refilling its stored sugar. So most of the stored sugar in your body, like eight tenths of it, uh, over 75% of it is stored in the muscles. That's your main storage depot for glucose. It's called glycogen in its storage form. and the muscles need insulin to take that glucose back up out of the blood. So that's its anabolic job. Now, it also acts on fat cells, and fat cells will also take up glucose. That's mainly to make triglycerides in the fat cells. So the fat will, you know, will fill itself with fatty acids combined with, with uh, uh, glucose, essentially, to make stored fat. But most of that glucose is going to go into your muscle cells unless you are highly sedentary and you're not burning any of that stored glycogen, then the muscles don't need any glucose. So it, most of that's going to go to the fat mm -hmm. or it's going to keep circulating and the liver is going to get filled with fat or filled with glucose, which gets turned into fat. So that's insulin's anabolic job. On the other side, I said anti-catabolic. So catabolic is, is when we break down stored things. So the liver has stored glucose as glycogen also. That's where the other 20% is in the body. 
the fat uh, cells, our adipocytes, have stored fat in them. And when you're not eating, the liver releases glucose into your bloodstream and the fat cells release fat into your bloodstream. And that's the fuel for our body to work. Insulin stops those two from happening. So when your pancreas releases that surge of insulin, it tells your liver, nope, stop that. We got plenty coming in. We don't need any glucose, stored glucose release in the bloodstream. And it tells your fat cells, hold back that fat. We got plenty of energy coming in. And so that's an important function because if you have high blood sugar or high triglycerides or high LDL particle number, when you are fasting, that's when most of us go get blood work and we say, oh, our blood sugar is high or triglycerides are high. That's from, that's because this anti-catabolic effect of insulin is not working properly, right? So insulin's supposed to hold that back in your liver to keep it in a good range. It's not doing that. And we call that insulin resistance. So that's in a fasted state, insulin resistance in a fasted state. That mostly happens in the liver and to a lesser extent in the fat cells. Does insulin have an effect on cell division, cell reproduction? Uh, does it speed up cell division? I, I, I was wondering about that as well. Yeah, well, insulin will stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Hmm. Um, it has a less of an effect, but it can have an effect on um, adipocyte cell differentiation. So it can stimulate the production of mm. new uh, fat cells in the subcutaneous tissue mostly. Um, but that's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Insulin has an effect on the brain um, and not only a glucose. Uh, so insulin acts on certain brain cells particularly the brain cells in the area that's associated with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So sometimes we'll see uh, those cells become insulin resistant and not able to take up glucose properly. Like the hippocampus, temporal mm -hmm. lobes, yep. those regions. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So um, yeah, it has a, it has a wide range of every cell in the body actually has insulin receptors. They haven't found one that doesn't yet. So, these, um, uh, you know, insulin can act in, in every cell, mainly metabolic effects or stimulating mm -hmm. growth.